Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. We're taking a look today at the new Amazon Fire TV Stick 4K. I have the Max Edition here, but we're going to talk a lot about the non-Max version as we're working our way through the review because there's not as much of a performance difference now between the Max and the new updated second generation 4K stick. So stay tuned. We're going to dive into what this device is all about in just a second. But I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that I paid for this with my own funds. All of the opinions you're about to hear are my own. No one is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this new Fire Stick is all about. Now, as many of you know, the price point on Amazon devices varies greatly depending on when you're shopping for one. So I would suggest checking my affiliate link in the video description to get the current price. There is not a huge price difference now between the Max and the regular 4K stick. And what I would like to do first here is talk about how the Max differs from the entry-level 4K stick. There used to be a pretty big difference in performance, but not anymore. So both the Max here and the now second-generation 4K stick have pretty much the same processor, a MediaTek 8696. This one is clocked a little bit faster, so it's slightly more powerful. I don't think most users are going to be able to tell the difference between the two. And what's most interesting to me is that the new second generation 4K stick, the entry level one, is pretty much the same performance wise as last year's Max stick was. So I think for most people, it's going to be more than adequate. But what are the differences besides just a little bit more processing power? Well, the Max here has more storage, 16 gigabytes of storage versus eight gigabytes on the other 4K stick. Does that make a difference? It might if you are downloading a lot of apps, mainly games that obviously take up more storage on the device, but that may not be that important to you if you're just streaming media from it. Another difference between this one and the other 4K device is that this has additional Wi-Fi 6 support. So both devices now support the newer Wi-Fi 6 standard. The entry-level 4K stick works only on the 5 gigahertz band. This one will work on the 5 gigahertz band, but also the 6 gigahertz band, which is part of the Wi-Fi 6E standard. However, I did a speed test on mine a little bit earlier, and I saw really no difference connected to my 6E network at 6 gigahertz versus my regular six network at five. So the Wi-Fi performance is great on both of these, but I don't know if you necessarily really need that 6E performance because you're going to get very similar performance out of the one that just supports the five gigahertz band. And what's most interesting is that they sell both of these devices with a ethernet option, but the ethernet runs at only 100 megabits and you're gonna get four times that on Wi-Fi, so I would probably stick to the Wi-Fi. Another difference is that this has a fancier remote with more buttons, so you can control more things from a single remote control. That might be valuable for some of you, but if it's not, the other one obviously is going to work just fine for controlling it and your TV and some uh, volume controls as well. Now there's one other feature that's different on the Max, which I'll demonstrate when we plug it in, called ambient mode. It gives you the ability to control some things in your home with the remote control on your television. That is a software feature that is not on the other 4K stick, even though it's capable of running it. So they were probably stretching to find some ways to enhance this one over the entry level 4K offering. Both sticks support four different HDR modes, including HDR10, HDR10+, HLG, and Dolby Vision and they also support Dolby Atmos. And I tested this a little bit earlier on my home theater system upstairs and had no issues running Netflix, Disney Plus, Amazon Prime Video, Apple TV, all the major services are on here and all work just fine. And I'll show you the performance as you're browsing around here in a little bit. Of note, these new Fire TV sticks, both versions, support the new Dolby AC4 standard, which is what the new ATSC3 broadcast standard supports for audio. So if you are one of the first people that are getting into ATSC3 television and all the drama associated with it, uh, you can uh, get native AC4 audio through the stick here. So that was nice to see getting added to the mix. 
There's not much on the hardware side here. It's very similar to the other devices. It's an HDMI stick that you can plug directly into your TV. They also give you an extension cable here if it's not practical to get it uh, behind your television in that way. And of course, you get your power adapter along with the USB connector. They're still using the older micro USB standard and not USB type C. This is an OTG port, so you could use the Amazon uh, Ethernet adapter, but again, that runs slower than your Wi-Fi will, or you could get a third-party one to plug in if you wanted to stretch it out a little bit more. I think most enthusiasts who are really into the Fire TV ecosystem will likely go with the Cube that does have some more expansion capabilities, but uh, as you'll see in a minute, uh, the sticks here are actually very nicely performing now, especially with this next generation hardware. So let's plug this in now and see how it performs and what we can do with it. So before we jump into the rest of the device, let's take a look at this max only feature, which is called ambient mode. You can choose the background. I've got it on seasonal video and it will rotate through different videos that will change according to the season. Although we're still in autumn and I'm getting winter scenes here. Hopefully that's not a harbinger of an early snowfall. And as you can see, I've got some widgets up here on screen that can bring me to things quickly. So I've got my next delivery coming up here. I've got some of my smart home favorites that I can access. I've got some of the top 10 things here. And if I click on any one of these widgets, it will bring me out to the app that uh, will let me dive into that interaction more deeply. Now, if I hit the button here on the controller, I can go through here and remove widgets, change the background, add widgets and go to my ambient preferences. There's not much in the way of widgets right now that I can add to the mix. There's just a couple here at the moment, but I'm sure they will add more as time goes on. And then you can go in and further adjust your preferences here. You can also get at this from the settings screen. And they do have some good tips on preventing burn-in on your OLED television. So I would spend some time in here. By default, it will uh, do its best to protect your screen. You can also have it disable this ambient mode and just turn the device off when it goes idle. So if you don't want this, you can switch it off. But this is really the only software feature difference between the Max and the regular 4K. And to clarify that ambient mode is only going to appear when your Max goes idle or you summon it with the remote control. When you first boot it up, what you're gonna get is your main menu here. And this will look very similar to other Amazon devices you may have used. This is running Fire OS 8. And as you can see here, things are super zippy and responsive here on the Max. Although I don't think it's going to be much zippier on the second generation 4K stick, the entry level 4K device. So I think this is the kind of performance you can expect from here. I'm gonna do a quick voice command and summon up some content to see how fast things respond. So let's try this, Meridian on Netflix. And what I did is I held down the button here and spoke into the remote, and then it executed that voice command after I let go. And as you can see, it found the piece of content on Netflix that I want to watch. This is a Creative Commons piece that I can get away with without copyright issues. And if I hit the play button here, it's going to summon the Netflix app and start playing back the content here. One thing I'm noticing is that we're getting a much better experience, at least with Netflix, when it comes to frame rate switching. And this has been a pet peeve of mine because many movies and TV shows on Netflix are recorded at 24p, 24 frames per second. And if your device is not switching your television into that mode, some things can look a bit jittery. And the good news is we're starting to see some support for Amazon's support of this feature. For a long time, only Amazon's app would do it properly but now it looks like Netflix is doing it. I was able to see that a few things that I loaded up did switch into their proper frame rate, although Disney Plus is not working. So it's a matter of these developers supporting the feature on the Fire TV. And it looks like we're seeing that now on Netflix. And of course, you could also see how quickly everything booted up there. So very quick to go from the menu to the app to playing something, which is nice. You're still gonna get a bunch of advertising kind of inserted into your interface here because these devices are subsidized by what you'll end up buying through Amazon over the course of your ownership. But it's not all that much in the way as much as it may have been in the past. One thing I'm noticing though is there is a lot of, of focus on free stuff. 
So on the menu here, if you go to the left of the home screen, you're going to have a whole free section here that you can find a whole bunch of free stuff to watch. And if I go over to my apps, what you'll also find is more free stuff kind of getting uh, tossed your way. So as you can see, there's a bunch of these apps that installed just on default, on first boot, uh, for sports highlights and food and cooking and trending trailers and viral videos and lots of free advertiser supported content, which is a big push from Amazon right now. So you don't even need a Prime account to get a lot of free content out of this. You're also going to find on the remotes here a live button. And what this will do is take you into the live TV feature that works a lot like Pluto and some of the other free providers work. And this is a curated list of stuff that Amazon has put together. If you push this button here, the uh, little three-line hamburger button, you can go in and manage what channels appear on this. I don't see many apps supporting this channel guide right now. It just looks like two Amazon sources, but you can go through and kind of configure everything. So if you're looking for something that's just going to play stuff for free, you're going to have plenty of it here. Uh, YouTube, of course, is front and center along with Amazon's freebie. You got the free channels. And then if you're still trying to find stuff, the free section here will help you out. And of course, you can install other free apps like Tubi and Pluto to get even more stuff without having to pay anything to watch it. You'll just be inundated with ads while you go. Now, like other Amazon Fire TVs, this will integrate with your smart home devices that are Amazon compatible. So for example, I can push the button here and say, show me the garden camera. And what this will do is have a brief delay and then pull up the camera in the garden so I can see what's going on outside. There are some devices, not the ones that I have, uh, that will actually come up automatically when somebody triggers a motion alert or rings the doorbell. And I can also, if I'm waiting for somebody, for example, kind of minimize this in a picture-in-picture -picture window and keep doing other things so I can keep an eye on what's going on outside. And this is a neat feature that was once only on the Macs, but now the regular stick can do this as well. So let's take a look at some gaming options now. Both Fire TV sticks should do a passable job streaming games. And they're only kind of marketing game streaming on the Macs, but the regular one is more than capable of doing it as well. And right now I'm checking out Amazon Luna, which is Amazon's streaming app. And you will get, if you are a Prime subscriber, a rotating list of games that you can stream from Amazon servers for free. And you also can play games that are in your Ubisoft game library that you might have purchased elsewhere. So I've got a couple of games that I bought on Steam that are also available to me here. So why don't we load up one here? Let's try Tom Clancy's The Division. This is the PC version of the game that I'm going to stream from Amazon servers to my Fire Stick here. And I've got my Xbox controller connected over Bluetooth. So let me load up the game here and when it's ready, We'll see how it runs. So here is the PC version of the Division streaming from Amazon servers. What you're going to notice here is that we've been getting a couple of frame rate hits as I've been running around. So this is streaming at 1080p 60, but you'll notice occasionally that network FPS dropping a bit. And it seems to be dropping when I'm changing scenes or uh, summoning something else up in the game. So I think this might be the server lagging a little bit when it loads in new game elements versus network issues. As you can see here, we're getting a bit rate of about 20 megabits per second. And for the most part here, the game seems to be running fine. We are using my five gigahertz Wi-Fi 6 network down here. This is the same experience you'll have on the regular second generation 4K stick that also supports Wi-Fi 6 at five gigahertz. I don't think this would be running any better on my six gigahertz network upstairs. So I think if you've got a decent Wi-Fi connection, these games should run fine when you're streaming it from Amazon or from Microsoft or from Nvidia or one of the other uh, streaming services that might be out there. And I think it's kind of a neat thing if you have Prime to uh, be able to get access to some of your PC game library in addition to some of the free games they offer via this service. They also have, of course, an added subscription plan you can go on to get access to more games, but this is what you get with just a regular Prime subscription. Now in the App Store, you'll also find games that you can run natively on the Fire Stick. This one is Shovel Knight that came out a number of years ago on the Fire TV platform. 
And these run fine. The one issue I think they're going to have with games moving forward is that the Fire TVs are still running a 32-bit operating system, and most of the newer games in the Android ecosystem are going to be supporting 64-bit or actually requiring 64-bit in the future. So gaming has never been kind of a core function of these devices, and as such, the level of processing power for games on these is very limited versus a game console like a Nintendo Switch or, of course, an Xbox or PlayStation. And on the 3D Mark Slingshot benchmark test, we got a score of 799. This is right within the margin of error of the prior generation Fire Stick 4K Max, which, by the way, is also likely where the regular second generation 4K stick is going to land, at least when it comes to gaming. So if you're looking to do some higher end gaming on a Fire device, the Cube, the third generation Cube that you'll find on Amazon is the one you're going to want to get for that. Because as you can see here from the chart, it is considerably more powerful and much better suited for game emulation and a lot of other higher end gaming tasks. But again, the Fire TV ecosystem is really not much of a gaming platform. Now, before we dive into some technical topics here, I did want to sum things up for the casual user. I think for most, the regular 4K Fire Stick is going to be more than adequate. You're not likely gonna notice much of a performance difference versus what you just saw here on the Max because they are using the same processor and for most tasks, it's going to be hard to tell any kind of difference at all. And I think as you were watching, if there were things that the Max offered, like the ambient mode, the remote, the added storage that you think you might need, then the little bit more money that you will have to spend on the Max might be worth it. But for most, I think the regular 4K stick is going to be more than fine. One of the reasons why you might want to choose a Fire Stick over a Roku is that you'll have access to Amazon's ecosystem of smart home devices. So if you are using Amazon to control lights and other things in your home, you'll be able to control them through your Fire Stick just like you can with an Amazon voice device. And that might be a benefit. Plus you have the ability to install apps beyond just the streaming services that you might want to watch on it. So good stuff, not that expensive and a nice bump in performance across the 4K line, which was a good thing to see. Now let's get technical. I did do a bunch of Plex testing earlier and I was pleasantly surprised with its performance. I played a bunch of 4K Blu-ray MKVs. I was able to get Dolby Vision working properly, movies with HDR work properly, Dolby Atmos lossless audio worked as well, which was great. And of course, frame rate switching and all that stuff worked too, but the DTS lossless formats did not work. And that's an issue that we also have seen on the Cube as well. So we're not quite there with a replacement uh, for the uh, NVIDIA Shield, for example, but we're getting very close to it. And I was surprised by how good the experience was here on the Fire Stick. But remember, you need to have a good network connection for it to work. And you'll be relying on Wi-Fi for the most part on this one. So if you have people that are really hitting your Wi-Fi network quite frequently, that might make an impact in your Plex video playback performance. And remember, the Ethernet option on this is only running at 100 megabits, so you're not going to be able to get the full Blu-ray bit rate that some movies require. So there are some compromises here, but I was surprised that it did as well as it did, which was very encouraging. And if it supported lossless DTS, we'd have a winner here, but not quite, and our quest will continue. Broadcast TV worked fine on it. I used the HD Home Run app to tune in some stuff from my cable system and also over the air. Everything played back fine, and the processor here was keeping up with moving around channels and stuff without issue. I also loaded up the Comcast Xfinity app. That one worked pretty well, too. So not much to complain about here. This is a very nice, relatively affordable 4K device, and I think it will perform quite well for most casual uses. That's going to do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Brian Parker, Chris Allegretta, Hot Sauce and Video Games, Logic KGR, Tom Albrecht, and Om De Brown. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month.
Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.